Hey everybody, so in this lecture we're going to talk about waves, we're going to introduce the concept of waves, and we're going to talk about some of their properties. So to start with, um, it's useful I think to develop a kind of an intuition for waves, uh, and waves are essentially the, the propagation or the transfer of energy through a particular medium. And I think a great uh, example of a wave that we can kind of think of is uh, when you uh, drop something in a pond and you see this kind of ripple effect. Right, and this ripple effect is essentially the propagation of the energy, uh, the energy that resulted from the, say we dropped a pebble, um, that energy is transformed into a wave, and that wave kind of ripples outward inside of our medium uh, in the form of uh, these circles, right? Now if you were to take a cross-section of, uh, of this wave, or if you were to take a cross-section of these ripples, right, let's say you were to open up the, the wave from here, or open up the circle from here, and you were kind of to take a cross-section what that would look like is that would have the shape of a wave, and the shape of the wave would be like this. Right? And uh, essentially, the, you've got the, the higher periods, or the higher areas, and then the lower periods, and then higher, and lower, and higher, and lower, and actually it's going to do this, but we're not going to talk about that type of a wave. We're just going to talk about a wave that has this general shape, right? The general shape that I drew down here. Right? Now, waves have got uh, a number of properties that are useful for us to understand. So, first of all, let's go ahead and draw this center line. And this center line is essentially what the medium would look like when it was at rest. So, in the case of the pond, uh, before we drop the pebble, uh, that center line is just going to be the, the height of the pond, right? And the ripples are going to be above and below the normal height of the water. Now, I want you to notice something interesting about this wave. Notice that it repeats itself. Now, that height, the height of the water above the center line, that is what we call the amplitude. And amplitude is symbolized as an A, capital A. And actually, let me go ahead and use a smaller pen for that. So amplitude is written as a capital A. And amplitude is uh, the height of the wave above that center line, right? And it turns out that the, the opposite is also going to be true. This is going to be negative of amplitude, right? So these downward uh, parts of the wave, right? And so again, this is going to be A, amplitude. So A is amplitude. And so again, as we said, the wave has got a crest up here and it's got a trough down here, right? And the height of the wave is the amplitude. And really the technical definition of that is the maximum displacement of the wave, right? Or we can also just kind of say the maximum height of the wave relative to uh, the resting point or the center line. Now, another property of the wave is what we call the wavelength. And so there's something interesting about these waves, which I'm sure you've probably noticed, is that they repeat themselves, right? The wave essentially does some type of a cycle, and then it repeats itself, and it does that cycle again. So I'm kind of drawing it badly. Uh, of course, it should repeat itself. It should look the same uh, from a given point to a given point. And the cycle within which the wave repeats itself is what we call the wavelength. Or more specifically, the wavelength is the distance. So this would be one wavelength, right? One wavelength. And a wavelength is a measurement of distance, and we represent it with the Greek letter lambda, so it looks like this, right? And it's in units of meters. And more commonly, you'll see it not just in meters, but in, say, micrometers or nanometers, right? But the point is, it's a unit of distance, right? That is to say, it's the physical distance spanned by one wavelength, right? And again, a wavelength is one repeat of the wave. So we notice that here is a second wavelength, right? Uh, if the center line would kind of extend it out this way, this would be wavelength number two, right? And we could keep going. And the wave would uh, really just keep going this way. And so we've drawn amplitude, we've drawn wavelength, right? So amplitude again is this to this, wavelength. And next we've got the frequency. And so it turns out, of course, that this wave is moving Right? So this wave is going to propagate in the same way that when we watch the, the pebble in the water, we see that the ripples are moving outward. Right? And so let's imagine that we were to kind of 
monitor a particular point, right? And we were to see the waves moving out and through the point, right? Physically through the point. So the waves would do this, right? And we wanted to see how fast is this wave moving? And the way that we would do that is we would measure the number of waves or the number of these crests that pass through a given point every second. So essentially it's the number of wavelengths that pass through a given point each second. And that is what we call the frequency. And we'll go ahead and use a different color for frequency. Frequency again is the number of waves or one number of wavelengths we could say that pass a given point each second. So the frequency is typically written as this cursive F. Let me try and fix that, kind of like this. And it's a lowercase kind of cursive F. And its units are number per second. And that's number of waves, but we can really actually just write it as per second or seconds inverse, right? That is to say the number of something per second. And so we often write it just as seconds inverse, like this. And it turns out, of course, there is a special unit for frequency. So we don't typically write it as seconds inverse like this. We typically will write it as hertz. And the hertz is really just the number per second, right? So hertz is an SI unit, but it really just kind of comes out to seconds inverse. And it turns out there's something also called period. So I'm going to do period in this dark blue. And I think it's reasonably visible. We're not really going to be dealing with period much in the future, so I can uh, kind of use this difficult color. And period is written in as a capital T, right? And period actually, fun fact, is just the inverse of frequency. So if frequency is the number of waves that pass through a given point each second, um, then period is the amount of time it takes for one wave to pass through a given point. So let's say it's the wave starts here and it passes through and we end up at this point over here. Then how long did that take, right? And that is period. And again, that's just the inverse of frequency, right? Frequency is the number of waves per second uh, and period is the number of seconds per wave, right? So period is equal to uh, the number of, so this is in terms of units, seconds per wave and we just write it as seconds. So the units of period are seconds. It's a unit of time, essentially, right? And so unlike frequency, it doesn't have a special unit of hertz. It's just written in terms of time. All right, and so these are some of the important properties of waves. And now from these properties, we can derive some interesting equations. So really there's one equation that's kind of the gold standard here. This equation is really a very important one that uh, you really gonna wanna memorize. And it says that frequency times the wavelength, so wavelength, is equal to the velocity of the wave. Now, I'm going to show you why that's true from a standpoint of units. So we said that units of frequency are in hertz, but oftentimes they are in written as per second, right? And of course, the wavelength is in meters, right? So when you multiply meters times per second, you get meters per second, right? Which is just the velocity of the wave. And we can also think of it as if we're, frequency is the number of waves that pass a given point per second, and uh, this is the length of a wave, then we get the distance of each wave that passes through a given point per second. And this is the velocity right, the velocity of the wave. How fast is the wave moving um, in terms of distance per second, right? And sometimes you'll see this equation written instead of V, you'll see it written as, uh, as C. So sometimes you'll see it written at like this. So C, and I'm gonna write it backwards just so that we're consistent. C is equal to wavelength times frequency. And C is the variable that we use for the speed of light. So C is not just speed, but it's the speed of light specifically, right? And so if we're dealing with a light wave, for example, we're always gonna be dealing with C. Whereas if we're dealing with sound waves, then the V is gonna be different, the velocity is gonna be different. So it depends on the type of wave. 
some waves are faster than others. So light waves, for example, are much, much faster than sound waves. And sound waves, of course, are going to depend, their speed is going to depend on what medium they're traveling through, and we'll talk about that later. But just do keep in mind that this is just a variation on this equation, right? And uh, C, by the way, is the C that's found in E equals MC squared, right? So that C is just the speed of light. All right, now let's go back up here. And I want to talk briefly about interference. So I want to talk about what would happen if we had multiple waves in a given space. And actually, let's not go up there. Let's actually make our own, uh, let's make a new, uh, a new wave. So go ahead and draw this line. And we will draw our initial wave. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a different color. And that's good enough. And we'll go ahead and uh, complete the wavelength. OK. And so maybe the wave looks like that. It's kind of supposed to, it's supposed to be a consistent wave, but I'm not the best artist. So let's go ahead and see what would happen if we were to add another wave. So what would happen, for example, if we were to superimpose on top of this wave another wave that is exactly the same? So maybe it will look something like this. And let's just imagine these are kind of perfectly overlapping. And so what would happen if we were to do that? Let me move this down here. And what would happen is, and really this happens whenever we add up two different waves, uh, is that they kind of they kind of add together and their effects add together. So at any given point, their effects are going to um, be summed together. So for example, when we look at the wave here, right, both of them are at point zero, right? Both of them have a value of zero. They're both at the midline. So the, both of them are in the ultimate wave. Both of them are going to be, you know, the, the combined wave is just going to be here, right? And it turns out at any of these, what we call nodes, these are the points where we cross the midline. Because it's just 0 plus 0, it's still going to be 0, right? So 0 plus 0, it's still going to be 0. But then at these points, the amplitude is going to double, right? Because it's the amplitude of 1 times the ampli or plus the amplitude of the second one. And so there are two amplitudes instead of 1. So it's going to double. So it turns out what this wave is going to look like is it's going to look like this. So it's double the amplitude. And the same case is going to happen at the troughs. So it's going to look like that. So the troughs are going to be double the height or double as low. And it's not quite perfectly drawn, but you can see the idea, right? That we've added the amplitudes here. And so the amplitude doubled here and amplitude doubled in the peaks. But then at the nodes, the amplitude did not change. Right, so let me try and zoom in so we can see what's happening. So in this case, the wave became twice as high, the amplitude doubled. And so this is what we would call constructive interference. What happened is that the two waves combined to make an even larger wave. Now that's not the only type of interference that we could have. So let's go ahead and copy this wave and show a different type of interference. And so what would happen uh, when we added these waves up? So once again, our nodes are going to remain at zero, right? Zero plus zero, they're both, you know, they're both at the midline, so it's both, both gonna have an amplitude of zero, so zero plus zero is zero, right? Uh, this is kind of supposed to have a node right at the midline. And what happens here? Well, here we add up an amplitude, so we add up A plus negative A, right? And so they are going to cancel each other out, and they're going to be here at all of these nodes and antinodes, right? And it turns out even at points like this, where let's say it's half of the amplitude, well, it's going to be half the amplitude positive here and half negative here. So they're going to cancel each other out. So it turns out that these waves are going to do this. So let me make the pen bigger so that I can show you what we do. It turns out they're going to cancel each other out perfectly, and they're going to stay at the midline. So these two waves are going to destroy each other. Right? They're going to combine to destroy the effects of each wave, and we're going to end up with what we would call destructive interference. Destructive interference. And so if we zoom out, we see the difference between constructive interference, where the waves summed up to double the amplitude, right, to have twice as much amplitude, versus uh, where the waves summed up to destroy each other and have no effect. 
And actually, fun fact, if you've ever used noise-canceling headphones, uh, the way that noise-canceling headphones work is essentially when, and specifically this is active noise-canceling, is when there's a loud sound in your environment, your headphones will actually make a destructive interference wave. So they'll make a wave that cancels out the, the sound from outside, and that's why they will make, uh, they make the environment even quieter than they would if they just kind of muffled the sound. And of course, we wouldn't want headphones that did constructive interference because that would make the, the, the sounds from outside uh, even louder. So we wouldn't want that. And so when we're looking at interference, it matters how the waves are overlapping. And we can really just add their amplitudes together to figure out what the combined wave is going to be. And so we've talked about a lot of things relating to waves here. We talked about how waves are propagation of energy. And we talked about some of the properties of waves, frequency, amplitude, wavelength, and period. And so again, I'm going to reorganize this slide so that we can see the basics of what we talked about here. But that's what we want to know as a baseline or as the basics for waves.